Hey, hey, good morning, good morning. Welcome to our morning Bible discussion. My name is Chip Mitchell, and I am so glad that you've decided to join us as we are being grounded in God's Word. Come on, come on. Uh, this is a live broadcast uh, with TikTok, and uh, we are jumping into the Word. What's up, Potato and Phillips? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm so excited to have all of you uh, join. We are doing it. What's up, Dan? How you doing? Sea Breeze. Hello, hello, hello. Dana, how are you? Bad wish. Hey, guys, how are you? How are you? It's good to see you. It's good to see everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. My camera's a little cockeyed here. I don't know how to fix that. Um, sorry about that. Tammy, how are you? Welcome, 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 welcome. I'm so excited to get into the Word of God today with you. Hey, yesterday we just blew it out, guys. We went through two chapters, Acts chapter 6 and 7. Stephanie, how you doing? Good morning, good morning. It's so good to see everyone. I'm excited. Angela, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see everyone as we dive on in to the Word of God. I want to welcome everyone. Hey, thanks for the heart. Come on, potato and Philip. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hey, Bridgie, how you doing? How are you? Uh, Marna, uh, Moran, how are you? Tammy, how are you? Lois, uh, <laughs> like me up inside. <laughs> That's awesome. V, how you doing? Servant of God. Welcome, 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 welcome. Well, hey, guys, how you doing? Um, my name is Chip Mitchell. We jump into the Word of God every morning at 7 a.m. Potato! <laughs> Light it up, baby! <laughs> uh, we jump into the Word of God every morning. We work a chapter at a time unless we really crank through a chapter and get through it faster. Um, today, we're going to be continuing our journey through the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to do. Crow Talker, what's happening? Good morning, good morning. Hey, what do I do? When I do this, I go through a chapter at a time. I don't stop and, and deal with a lot of questions that may come up, not because I'm avoiding the questions. Hey, I wait till the end. If you have questions, I'll jump on those questions at the end. But I do, uh, you know, a lot of times we get folks on here that reject God. Hey, Meg, how are you? Uh, that don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible, maybe feel it's fictitious or a myth. That's okay. Hey, we're not we're not pushing out any hate. Um, we're open to dialogue. I just ask, hey, we can all be respectful to each other, right? Respecting the humanity that's within all of us, right? So that's what we want to do. And hopefully we can have a discussion going back and forth uh, with anyone that has a question or disagreement with the idea of faith. Amen. Let's pray, guys. And then we're going to jump on in. I uh, want to remind you, if you can't stay for the whole time, uh, I do upload, the, upload these on YouTube, and if you go to at Chip Mitchell 23, make sure you put the at sign before Chip Mitchell, at Chip Mitchell 23, that's the YouTube page. I usually upload these by the end of the day, and that way you'll have all of it. You'll have the whole series on there, uh, which would be a great, and that's at Chip Mitchell 23. If you don't put the at, you're going to go to a motorcycle uh, thing, which is pretty cool. Well, the blessings you've given us. And God, we do face many challenges in different ways. And we uh, ask for your guidance. We ask for your strength, your ability to give us strength. Father, we desperately need to persevere, to endure. Give us a, 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 a mindset of wisdom so that we can seek to understand what your will is in the midst of troubled waters. Help us to follow your spirit as it guides our heart and our mind. Let us keep in step with it. And as we look at your word today, Father, please open wide our hearts and our minds to understand your word, that we may live in such a way that brings honor to you. God, you're amazing. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get to it. Acts chapter 8. We just finished Acts chapter 7 yesterday. And what do we find in the latter, the last uh, couple of verses in Acts chapter 7 is Stephen's death, right? Stephen stands before the Sanhedrin. He confronts the Sanhedrin. What does he confront them with? Resisting God's spirit. He goes through this whole 
eloquent message of how God had moved through the patriarchs earlier, and yet people always resist it, and he confronts them. Why do you resist the Spirit? And at this point, they're furious. They drag him outside of the city, and they stone him. They stone him. And they do this in front of a gentleman by the name of Saul, who would eventually become the Apostle Paul. And in verse 49, we read the ending of chapter 7. It says, while they were stoning him, listen to Stephen. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You see this prayer that he prays is similar to what Jesus prayed on the cross. He gave up his spirit unto God, if you will. He gave up his spirit. Very, very, you know, powerful. Jesus says, Father, into your hands I what? Commit my spirit. And then what do we see Stephen doing? He, he's praying to Jesus. This is the only prayer we see in the Bible where someone is actually praying to Jesus. And I think the reason being is that in his mind, he was imitating the life, the death, and was praying for the resurrection that Jesus had as well. Very powerful. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Because he knows that there is no hope after life without Jesus. Very powerful prayer. And then he fell on his knees and cried out. And then we, we know he's imitating Jesus because what does he cry out? Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That is the exact same thing that Jesus prayed when he died. Very powerful. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here we have Stephen imitating the death of Jesus with the hope of the resurrection that Jesus had. Very, very powerful. And then it says, and then he fell asleep. We see this phrase, falling asleep. This is what they, how they described death, falling asleep. Why? Because they believed in a resurrection and that you would wake up. Um, and then we go right into chapter 8, and what does it say? And Saul approved of their killing of him. This tells you where Saul's heart was with regards to Christianity. And this is why Saul or the Apostle Paul is such a great person to use when you're dealing with folks who resist the Word of God or resist the credibility of the story of Christ. Why? Because you have an individual that is clearly anti-Christ. He is against Christianity. He is against the resurrection of Jesus. He's against the Lordship of Christ. And yet something took place in his life that transformed him to a totally different individual, a powerful moment. And whenever he attests to what was it that changed his mind, he goes back to the road to Damascus. Whenever he's sharing his story, he's sharing his story about how he met Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and that changed his life. There, you cannot deny that something took place. Even the critics that are atheists, the historians, the scholars, they do attest that something took place. They don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the Lordship of Jesus. They don't believe, but they definitely will say something took place in the Apostle Paul's life that changed him. Why? Because he was radically different. He opposed Christianity. He hated it. And he even gave his approval of those that were killed for their faith. And that transformation took place in Paul's eyes because of the resurrection. The resurrection is our benchmark. That's our grounding. That is our foundation. Jesus Christ, him crucified and rose again. And that is it. So chapter eight, what do we get? Well, man, all of a sudden Stephen is killed. Paul is there and Paul is so disdained with Christianity that some things happen. Verse one of eight, of Acts chapter 8, what do we see? On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. It's very powerful. Now, it's also pretty interesting when Jesus talks to the apostles, what does he say? First in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Well, <laughs> guess where they're getting scattered to? Judea. I mean, this is very powerful, very powerful. 
Now, they're getting scattered due to what? Persecution. Jesus, when he met with the uh, apostles before he left in Luke 24, he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Then he says, Judea and Samaria, then the ends of the earth. That's And now all of a sudden, they're all in Jerusalem at this point by Acts chapter 8. No one has left Jerusalem. And now when the persecution breaks out, the, the message of God is now going out in a powerful, powerful way all over the world. And, and that's just, that's, that's, that's pretty amazing here. So what do we see? Uh, we see this great persecution taking place. Now, what you've got to understand is that, um, imagine what this did to the church. Imagine what, uh, uh, took place with the church here. Um, all of a sudden, all the disciples that are living there, and I remember the men had gotten to over 5,000, over 5,000 men had, had gotten there. And so when you take their families, their wives, you know, you name it, relatives, th this is a huge group of people. And this persecution is so intense that the whole church is pretty much driven out of Jerusalem, except the apostles. Uh, you know, what are you willing to withstand for your faith? What uncomfortability are you willing to endure for your faith? What are you willing to go through for your faith? You know, I find it challenging for folks that seem to want to have a Christianity of convenience. Uh, uh, people generally, we our tendency is to look for comfortability. Um, you know, when it comes to participating in a fellowship, participating in, in benevolent acts with <clears throat> those that are in need, when it comes to participating in being one who gives to others, uh, whether that means to inconvenience your life or your resources, we, we, we generally want to be very comfortable. We go to a service maybe and the air conditioner isn't working and it's hot. We, we tend to get all in a knot or the seating isn't what it needs. I mean, you know, we got to be careful about looking for the comfortabilities that we can have in our life. Yes, conveniences, right? Um, and letting that drive how we feel. These people were driven out. Now, remember, a lot of them had come from all over the Roman Empire. So they didn't even have anywhere to go. Not only did they not have anywhere to go, they're being persecuted. And the persecution they're receiving is not somebody just calling them names. They just watch Stephen be Stone. And now notice what it says in verse two, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. So you got to understand that they saw his body. Can you imagine what his body looked like being stoned to death? Do, can you imagine the brutality of what that must have looked like being stoned? Uh, so this was, this was real. Think about the kids, you know, your family, you got three or four kids and, and they're all young, maybe elementary to middle school age, say, and, and, and these people are trying to kill you. When you think about who you are, maybe you're the provider, whether a male or female of that family, generally in the first century, it tended to be mostly the men. And, and then if your husband is killed, right, what, what will happen? These people were, were willing to endure hardship. And these are all young Christians. All of them are inside. You're talking inside of a year, maybe two. No more than that because the Apostle Paul was converted three years in. So you're talking a year to two years maximum that this is taking place for young Christians. And these guys are faithful. Godly men buried, verse 2 of Acts chapter 8, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But watch verse 3. But Saul began to do what? To destroy the church. Listen at what? how they described Paul's behavior. He was out to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Let me tell you something. We get a lot of uh, naysayers that come into our forum at different times. We get uh, a number of people that despise godliness or believing in God. We don't get people out destroying the church as far as what Paul was doing. But their intent is, in many cases, to destroy faith, destroy 
the church. Destroy believing in the word of God. Don't, don't think that that has ended. Um, look at what he's saying. This, this is, you know, Saul was wanting to destroy the church. And where did he go? Uh, the Bible says he went from house to house. This guy was going from every house where he could find Christians and he dragged them off, both women and men, men and women. This is what he's trying to do. You know, we put these forums together, right, to talk about faith or talk about God and spirituality. And and what what happens? What where do where do where do people go? They they want to come and destroy the idea of faith. They want to come and destroy the idea of credibility uh, on who God is. They they want to destroy that. Um, you know, humble Humbert. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. You, you, they want to destroy it because they want to look at Leviticus, right? And they want to talk about slavery and owning people, but they don't understand the full context of the Bible. They don't understand that first Timothy talks very specifically about the law was written for the most immoral people on the face of the earth, that the mall, that the law that was written in Leviticus was only to manage the, the mayhem and the madness of monsters here on earth, speaking of Israel. And that's why Paul got in a lot of trouble. But they don't understand that. Why? Because they don't know the scriptures. What they're doing is trying to what? Simply destroy faith. Destroy the idea of a trust in God. I get it. Why? Maybe they had a terrible experience with Christians. Maybe Christians lied and did terrible things, as we've seen historically. And it ruins the idea of faith. This is why it's so important for disciples of Jesus to act like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to, to decide that we're going to imitate Jesus. Notice when Paul goes from house to house, you don't see Christians beating him up. You don't see Christians yelling and, and, and trying to put together some kind of rebellion against it. What we see is that the Christians are being dragged off to jail. We're seeing their resistance be the same of that of Jesus. Thank you, Queen, for the roses. So appreciate your support and heart. That's what we see. And we've got to get out of the mindset of being uh, uh, culturally um formed by what we see in our culture and in our world. We've got to realize that our culture is the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. Who we are is to be like Christ. We imitate Christ. Amen. Hey, thanks for the follows. Hey, if you like what I'm preaching, you like what I'm teaching here, please go ahead and follow. That way, anytime I'm on live, you'll be notified and we can do this thing together. But Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off men and women, put them in prison. So Wow, so what happened to some of these people? Well, he's going to talk about some of them in verse 4. Uh, Philip, Philip, you know, in Samaria. Now, this is interesting, right? You're going to go to Judea and Samaria. Why is going to Samaria such a big deal? Well, the Samaritans live there. You remember in John chapter 4, when Jesus has the conversation with the Samaritan woman? The Samaritan woman, the, the Samaritans were so despised by the Jewish people that the rabbis would teach they are the only people that you can pray that they will be condemned by God. They, they, they despised the Samaritans so much that they taught this is the only group of people that you can pray that God will eternally condemn them. That is crazy. That is the sheer anger that they had towards the Samaritans. Why? Well, they felt like when the Babylonians and that whole thing took place in 586 BC, uh, when the temple was destroyed, these people went and married foreigners and they uh, married them and they messed up the bloodline of God. And so what do we get here? It's a hatred. And, and in the first century, when you read in John chapter four, when Jesus is having the conversation with the Samaritan woman, she talks about a temple that they worship there on that hill. They had even erected a temple for themselves to Yahweh. Why? They weren't allowed to come down and worship in Jerusalem. They were never allowed. And so they built their own temple. So this is, this is powerful that now Philip is now where he's going to Samaria. This, this is a big deal. This is the first attempt moving towards Gentiles being converted. Right. It's it's moving right towards that. I find it ironic. Paul is standing there. He witnesses Stephen's death. And now the scattering happens. Philip is going to Samaria. They're, they're moving. You can see God is moving towards 
the Gentiles being saved as well. So verse four of Acts chapter eight, it says those who had uh, been scattered, what did they do? They preached the word wherever they went. Verse four, what do we see? That even amidst the great persecution, thanks travelers for the uh, hearts. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the roses. Well, what do we see? Well, we see that those that were being persecuted, and they now mind you, they're running for their lives. They are running for their lives. But what were they focused on? They preached the word wherever they went. They did not stop sharing their faith. They kept on sharing about God. Let me tell you, there's always opposition. There's always going to be intense opposition in different ways and in different places, depending on where you live and the time that it is. But what it, what did we learn from these people? They kept sharing about God. They kept sharing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These people are running for their lives. They are running for their lives. That's what they're doing, running for their lives. And, and, and what are they doing? They're going to proclaim it wherever they went. Verse 5, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. What did he do? He proclaimed the Messiah. Now, you got to remember, this village in Samaria, wherever it was, the whole village came to believe in Jesus being the Messiah. Now, mind you, notice what it says. It uses this phrase, proclaimed the Messiah there. Why? Because that's what Jesus told her. Remember when he had the last in her action. She said, well, when the Messiah comes, he's going to explain everything. And she says, I am him. He, Jesus says that. So now all of a sudden Philip goes down there and what is he proclaiming? The Messiah has come. And I bet there were some that were like, whoa, I remember that dude when he came through. Acts chapter eight, verse five, verse six, when the crowd heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he said. Now, Verse six, it talks about Philip doing miracles. Now, prior to this, we know that the only people that were doing miracles were the apostles. But remember when they laid hands on those individuals in Acts chapter six? Well, when they laid hands on them, guess what it did? It, it, it gave them the ability to do miraculous signs and wonders. It gave them this power. So we have two things. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that everyone gets. But then we get the miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit that not everyone gets. The indwelling we get, why? Well, we're united with Christ, Romans chapter 6, Galatians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2. All those say we're united with Christ in baptism. That's that's, And we get the Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, 38, when we're baptized. Why? Because we're united with Christ. But then there's a miraculous of the Holy Spirit that has been doing things since the Old Testament. Since the Old Testament, we see the miraculous doing incredible things, whether it came down on Elijah, when he outran the chariots, whether it came down even on evil people, the prophet of Baal, Balaam, the spirit came down on him. When when Saul's men were going to uh, get David, the spirit came down on their evil intent and thwarted them from doing it. So the miraculous has a way of manifesting itself in different ways. What we see here in the New Testament is when the apostles laid hands on folks, they did something. You're going to see that as we go through this text. But Philip is there. He's proclaiming the Messiah. Now, mind you, he's with the Samaritans. These people were not connected to the lineage, if you will, or allowed to be connected with the Jews because they despised them because of their bloodline. So now he's coming over there, Philip, and he's preaching to them. And they're like, well, wait a minute. How, how can we trust this? And this is why he did the signs that he performed. And notice what it says. When he performed the miraculous signs and wonders, it says they paid close attention to what he said. He used the miraculous as a means for them to listen to his message. That is and why, because that's what they understood. If you're going to say extraordinary things, we need proof of this extraordinary teaching. And what they did there was what? Boom, miraculous signs. Verse 7. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So he did all kinds of miraculous signs and wonders. He healed the sick, the lame. In addition to that, 
He also cast out demons. Very powerful. Now watch what happens. Verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon uh, had pr uh, practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave them what? Their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Now, what you need to understand is that this idea of sorcery and all this other kind of stuff and witchcraft, it was present in the first century. This was present. People saw it. People saw things. They don't know. We don't know how they came, but you got to also remember there was great demon possession going on. So there was all kinds of spiritual things happening in the first century that Christianity was up against. And so you see this guy, Simon the Sorcerer, he amazed people in Samaria. Not only, <clears throat> not only did he amaze them, they called him the great power of God. And, and, and people followed him. Watch verse 11 of Acts chapter 8. They followed him because what? He amazed them for a long time with what? Sorcery. This stuff was, was alive and well. Sorcery. He amazed people. Some would say, well, he was just a magician. Some would say, no, he had some miraculous power. I, I can't tell you. What I can tell you is that the scriptures say he amazed people with sorcery. And, and there were so many, and there were many people that were following him, and they called him the great power of God. But watch this, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. So you got to understand, Simon's doing some stuff, but man, when they heard Philip, they heard something totally different. Not only did they hear something totally different, they believed. And listen at what it says. Same thing that we see in Acts 2. It says, when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, what did they do? They responded and they were baptized, both men and women. Now watch verse 13. Simon himself believed and was baptized. So here's Simon, who was all into sorcery, witchcraft, and things of that nature. Uh, what, is, what does he do? He believes, and he too is baptized. Wow. Both men and women. And then we also see Simon is baptized. And then what does Simon do? And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by what? The great signs and miracles he saw. Now, you can already see that something's going on in Simon's heart. He seems to be more mesmerized by what? The miraculous signs and miracles than he is of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he follows Philip around and he's marveling, marveling at the signs. Watch verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that, the, that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Now, listen at what they say in verse 14. In verse 14, they say that the apostles in Jerusalem heard Samaria had accepted the word of God. What are we learning here? This is a big deal. Why? The Samaritans were rejected by the Jewish nation. They were not, they were excluded. They were excluded, uh, excluded from the nation of Israel. And so, when the apostles catch word, well, Philip sent somebody back and said, hey, man, listen, Samaria has been open to the gospel. Well, how do they know they accepted it? Well, they believed and they were baptized. That's what we read a couple of verses before this. The acceptance of the message is belief and baptism. That, that's, that's what it is. So what did the apostles do? The apostles in Jerusalem, they said, well, we're going to send Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, now why, why, why are they there? Well, they're going to investigate this because this is a big deal. You know, they're converting Samaritans. Now, up until this point, it was only Jews that were being converted to Christianity. And so they're stepping out and they, you know, this is new territory. They're already being persecuted uh, by the Pharisees, Sanhedrins, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and now all of a sudden you start converting Samaritans. They, it's going to intensify. So what do we see? Verse 15, when they arrived, speaking of Peter and John, when they arrived, 
They prayed for the new believers there that they may what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what's he talking about here? That they may receive the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the miraculous. Watch, you'll see. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. So what is he talking about here? That the miraculous signs that Philip is doing, none of that had been unleashed to any of the other, the new disciples. And, and what was, what were they looking for in that? That is a marked sign that God is with this. That, that, you know, we see this here in Acts chapter eight, and we see this here also in Acts chapter 10. We see it in Acts chapter eight, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19. This manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Those are the three places that we see it. Why do we see it there? Well, because there's concern. Can the Samaritans be saved? And they didn't know. You know, I think for us, it's very easy to look at the biblical text and go, oh, well, yeah, salvation is for everyone. I mean, already they're two to almost, they're two years into this and they have not converted anyone that is not Jewish. The only people they've converted are those that are Hebrews or Jews. That's it. And, and they thought that salvation was only for God's people of Israel. That's it. They, they just did not, they, they had not figured it out that it was to all nations. They had not figured it out that it was to the Gentiles. And so when Philip goes out there and he preaches to Samaritans, you know, he's like, Hey man, uh, these people are believing about Jesus and he sends word back to Jerusalem and they go, we need to go check this out. And that's why they send Peter and John. It wasn't like they sent them because they were thinking, Hey, yo, that's great. More and more people. No, they were concerned. Hey, is this, can we convert Samaritans? They're not even allowed to go to the temple. And so what do they do? Well, when they get there, they, they prayed for them. They laid their hands on them so that what? They may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why? Why is that important? This Holy Spirit, this, this outward uh, showing of the Spirit was confirmation that this was right. You remember in Acts chapter 2, Jesus says, wait, the signal for you that I have done what I've said I'm going to do and I'm with you is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And as soon as they wait, and then, boom, a whirlwind, a violent wind, tongues of fire, it was a sign. Yes, he did it. And so they're like, okay. So when they go here to Samaritans, they lay hands on them. They want to see, God, give us a sign that the Spirit comes. Give us that sign so that we know we can convert these Samaritans. We see that here. We see that in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius. Cornelius is a Gentile. He is a Gentile. And when Peter goes into Cornelius' house, the first thing he says, and we'll get to it in Acts chapter 10, he says, you know, I wouldn't even come in a Gentile's house. This is, and, and so he's in there and he preaches the gospel and he's just sitting there going, I don't know if, the, if this is right. I mean, he had to have a vision from God three times just to be convinced that possibly you can convert a Gentile. And when he's speaking, the spirit manifests itself in a powerful way. And what does it serve as? A sign. Yes, the Gentiles, they can be saved. And that's what opens the door for them to preach the gospel. And that's the same thing that's happening here in Samaritans, with the Samaritans. It's proving that God is sanctioning that you can convert the Samaritans. So they prayed for the new believers that they may receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized. Listen to what he says, baptized in the name of the Lord. So they're united with Christ's Spirit. We know that that's what happens in baptism. And that's something that happens internally. You don't see that. There's no flame or anything like that. Then verse 17, it says, then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw, now watch this. This is what you're going to understand, the distinction between the indwelling and the outward. When Simon, and remember Simon was the sorcerer, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, give me also this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Well, why? He wanted that power. He wanted that power. 
And he says, man, I'll give you money that so that I, whoever I lay my hands on, they will receive it. This was something that was given only to the apostles. It had to be the apostles. And Simon saw, it says, Simon saw that the spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. But Peter answered, verse 20 of Acts chapter 8, Peter answered, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Wow. Oh, thanks for the crown. <laughs> Listen to Peter's strong words. May your money perish with you. Wow. Because you thought, and he's challenging him with just thinking, you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Then he says this in verse 21, you have no part or share in this ministry. And what's he talking about? This ministry of the apostleship. This was one that God appointed these individuals. He says, you have no part or share in this ministry. Why? Because your heart is not right before God. Wow. You know, uh, Peter uh, really confronts him right to the heart. He says, your heart is not right. For what? His thinking. Um, you know, our hearts get filled with two things, either the spirit of God or Satan. And that's why you read in certain passages that Satan entered him when he talks about Judas. Uh, and I said, far, how has Satan so filled your heart? You know, our hearts get filled with desires, either desires of the spirit or desires of the devil. That's what our hearts get filled with in our heart. That's our, our thinking, our mindset, our intentions, our desires. They're either getting filled with the spirit or filled with ill intention or demonic forces of evil or Satan. And that's why they use that. How has Satan so filled your heart? How have you allowed your heart to be filled with such desires that are contrary to what God desires for you? Wow. Um, and then what does he say in verse 22? Repent of this wickedness. And, and, and then what does he say? Uh, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. This verse 22 of Acts chapter 8 um, is really, it's a convicting verse, but it's also a very insightful verse. Notice what he says. He says, repent of this wickedness, right? The wickedness he's making reference to is his thinking because he hadn't done anything. He's just, his thinking. And he says, repent of this. Change your mindset about this. And then he says, which is interesting, and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. He, he almost... I mean, he says, in the hope that the Lord will forgive you. Like, wow, like, you know, I've always kind of go, no, God's, God's going to forgive you. The Lord's going to forgive you. Jesus will forgive you, right? Uh, yeah, but it's interesting. Um, what he's saying here is that in the hope that the Lord will forgive you, it, it almost kind of goes, man, you, you got to understand the severity of this thinking. You've got to understand the depth of which, where your heart has gone. And, and I don't think he, this is a text that says, maybe God will forgive you or maybe not. I, I don't think that. I think what he's conveying here is the harsh reality that your heart can get to a place that is so hardened that redemption is hopeless. Now, mind you, he's coming off of, after, you know, this is a year or two years of Judas, right? Judas's heart was filled with wicked thoughts, right? You know, and and he got to this place where he was not redeemable. Not that God couldn't, but his heart had gotten to such a dark place that he could not be redeemed. And um and and Peter confronts him. And not only that, notice what he says. Uh, in verse 23, 
Uh, now notice he says, for having such a thought, but then he goes to verse 23, he says, for I see that it's not just a thought, just this one thought, but that is indicative of some other things going on in his heart. He says, I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. There's a lot of bitterness that is that is in his heart. And, and, and that bitterness gives birth to different thoughts, right? And those thoughts then give birth to what? Sin, as the scriptures teach. But he was full of bitterness. So there was a lot of things in his heart, a lot of resentment that he had not dealt with when he became a Christian. There were a lot of things in his heart that were just festering and they were waiting for the opportune time to manifest themselves and to ruin them. Um, verse uh, uh, 24, Simon answers him and notice what Simon says. He says, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Wow. Very, very, very you know, and, and we all, right, uh, to Meg's point, we all have things in our past. And, and they, if we don't deal with them correctly, they can haunt us. Now, um, history uh, makes mention of this outside of the Bible, that Simon became a persecutor of the church. I don't know how true that is, uh, you know, but there is some historical evidence that they speak about that this Simon became one of the intense persecutors of Peter. And maybe it's because of what Peter said. You know, I don't know that to be true, but it, it does seem to fall prey with us as humanity when we get confronted about the truth of where we're at and it's ugly. We tend to get really, really mad, right? We, we, and, and, we, and we take it out on folks. Um, very, very challenging, very sober text here. Uh, verse 25 of Acts chapter 8. Hey, if you like what I'm doing, please go ahead and follow. Please follow me. It helps the algorithm. Uh, it'll also let you know whenever I do live, whenever I post things, go to my profile page. If you like some of the tidbits I put up there, click the like. Go ahead and do it. It helps the algorithm. Thank you, Craig. So appreciate the heart. My goal is to get more and more people to be able to have in-depth Bible study like this. Not preaching, but teaching. Going through a text so that people understand the Word of God can make great decisions. I want everyone to be grounded in the promises of God. That's my hope. That's my goal. Thank you. Verse 25, after they had uh, further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many, what? Samaritan villages. So now on their way back, what do they do? What do they do? Um, they start preaching in Samaritan villages. On their way there, they didn't. Why? Because they did not believe, they weren't convinced that the Samaritans could actually be saved. And now, because the Spirit manifests itself, uh, what did they do? When they turn around and they go back to the Samaritan villages, they they start preaching the Word of God. Now, uh, TikTok, TikTok, what's happening, man? Good to have you. Uh, they're just fables. You know, that, you know, there's an argument that people say, but it, it usually in fables, they don't reveal these kinds of nuggets like verse 25. It's revealing an ugly nature of mankind that they thought that salvation wasn't for everybody. <laughs> I mean, wow. Like, really? Like you, you thought it was only for your, your people, your race of people. Really? Really? <laughs> That's what they thought. Now, who would expose the ugliness of themselves when they're writing a story? People just don't usually do that. <laughs> you know, they just don't. And and that just gives you, oh, Daniel, what's happening in the universe? Wow. <laughs> Come on, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is, this is just another telltale sign of the truthfulness of the writers. You don't write you, the, the most embarrassing things about you. You just don't do that. Um, but but they did. They're exposing themselves. Why? Because they had found God. Now, verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip. Now here it is, right? We're, all kinds of miraculous stuff is happening in the first century. At the inception of the church, why? 
to get this thing moving and to get it outside of just Jerusalem. God used an unfortunate situation of persecution to finally get the gospel to spread elsewhere. Because at that point, no, no other nations, no other races of people were being converted, just those that were Jews. And so because of persecution and unfortunate things, Samaria, Samaritans are getting the word of God. Now they're like, wow, the Samaritans are getting it. Now watch, an Ethiopian is now going to get the message of God in verse 26. So Acts chapter 8, verse 26, it says, Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, uh, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So the, God is forcing this issue that they can get around more people of different nations so that they can hear the gospel. Verse 27, so he started out and went on his way. Uh, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of uh, Candia, which means queen of the Ethiopians. We don't know who this is. Many believe this is the individual that started the movement of God uh, in Ethiopia. This guy was uh, a eunuch, um, you know, uh, I love the story uh, of the eunuch. I mean, here's someone. Now, Jesus says some are born that way and some are made that way. Don't know. But one of the reasons they did this is to keep them from um, having sexual relations uh, with others. But at the end of the day, this guy's converted. And I praise God for that. But watch what happens. Uh, he was in charge of all the treasury of Candace, which means the queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So this was a, a man who was worshiping in Jerusalem. He was Jewish. And on his way home was sitting in the chariot reading what? The book of Isaiah, the prophet. Notice what he says, the book of Isaiah. We have the book of Isaiah, right? And, and he's reading from the prophets. Now, you know, this guy had a lot of money. You can't have a whole scroll of Isaiah if you're not very wealthy. That, you know, you can't just go to the library and check out a book. You can't order on Amazon in the first century and get a book. This dude was extremely wealthy. And he's reading from what? The book of Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Now, the spirit moves in different ways. This guy's got angels talking to him. He's got the spirit telling him to go do some things. And it's powerful. And then Philip ran up to the chariot. And heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Now, why did he hear the man reading the prophet Isaiah? Because the, the Old Testament scriptures were meant to be read aloud. They are written at a cadence that is meant to be read aloud. And so that's just all he was doing. He's reading it aloud. And notice what he says. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. This is a powerful question. Do you understand? Notice what he says. The Ethiopian eunuch in verse 31 says, how can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. You know, a lot of times people get offended that somebody says, oh, somebody needs to teach you the word of God. That's, that's, that's true. There, there, are, there are people that, need, that we need to be taught by, and that's okay. Uh, I, I have had people in my life for 37 years teaching me things in the word of God. We need folks in our life teaching us the word of God. And now I'm even going on to um, different professors, Gary Habermas. I, I'm, I listen to a lot of his lectures, Richard Balkum. I listen to a lot of his uh, uh, things, uh, um, uh, Craig Evans. I got another book I'm going to be reading on his work. I've listened to some of his lectures. Why? I want to be taught the word of God. I want to gain greater insight into the word of God. And that you, you, we all got to be humble about that. We can't say, well, I have arrived, uh, you know, and, and that's why we're doing this. You're right. You, I, I'm with you. Uh, hold on one second, guys, real quick. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry. My, my son is caught up in the uh, hurricane down south, and he's catching a plane uh, to get back. And his plane leaves at, uh, I think he said four. So my apologies for signing out. 
So back to the point, right? We all need someone in our lives teaching us. That That's a good thing, right? That's a great thing. Uh, so um, what is he reading? Well, he's reading the prophet Isaiah. And and he's, and he's Philip says, well, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. You know, we got to be humble, invite people. Why are we doing this thing? We're inviting people. I want you to invite people to come and learn the word of God with us. That's a good thing, guys. That's a good thing. So how can I, he said. He said, unless someone explains it to me. So Philip invited him to come up and sit with him. Verse 32, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. Now, where is he reading from? Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. It's a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. Notice what it says. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now, this is Isaiah 53. This is a passage that is all about the prophecy of the Messiah, about him coming and suffering. Yes, that's what this prophecy is. But you can go on TikTok and you tell people, they'll say, oh, give me a prophecy of Jesus. You say Isaiah 53, and they'll say, no, no, that's speaking about someone else. That's not speaking about the Messiah. This is what, look, you can say whatever you want to say about it. Philip, who's the evangelist there, who's written about in the scriptures, says this was about Jesus. This was about the Messiah. So I take his interpretation of the text over and above anybody else's. I don't care who you are. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care. Any, I'm just going to take what is in the scriptures, what is in the scriptures as its interpretation of the scriptures as truth. So when people want to argue that Isaiah 53 is not about the Messiah, you don't need to argue. You say, well, Peter, Philip, James, John, the apostles believed it so. Why? Because they often quote Isaiah 53. They often quote it in the context of Jesus. And here's one where Philip, well, who's he trained by? Well, we know he's trained by Peter and James. Those are the ones that came down. Thanks for the roses, you know, and here it is. And now watch this. Verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please. Who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And in verse 35, he says, Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about who? Jesus. Why? Because the passage was talking about Jesus. The passage was talking about the Masonic king. And so he used it. Now, the other thing to understand about this is God sets the times and places. Think about it. He's on this road, right? He's traveling. He just so happened to be reading Isaiah, and he just so happened to be reading Isaiah 53, and Philip just so happened to be coming by, right? I mean, God set the time and the exact location of these things to happen. That's what God does. That's He's always setting the right time. God is always setting you up for the right opportunity at the right time to accomplish his will. And, and so what does he do? Well, he, he speaks to him about the good news of Jesus. Now, it's very interesting when you read verse 35, he doesn't tell you any details about what he said about the good news of Jesus. He doesn't tell us anything, nothing. He just says, he just told us about the good news of Jesus, but watch verse 36. So uh, it says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? So you've got to understand that the message of Jesus, the conclusion ends with faith, repentance, and baptism. That's what it does. Because notice, you read verse 36 of 35, he says, he told him about the good news of Jesus. So he just heard it. He heard whatever he heard at the end of everything he heard. He goes, look, dude, there's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? What stands in the way? That's the message. Well, where did he get it from? Acts chapter 2. It's the same thing. It's, it, the, the message is the same. It never changes. Faith, repentance, and baptism. But he never talks about faith here. He never talks about uh, repentance here. But we know he does because the conclusion is the same conclusion that we get in Acts chapter 2. Philip's not going to change the message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. No one is. That, and, and he called them to it. I mean, you would say, well, he doesn't say repentance here. Are you really saying that? Like, 
how could you possibly believe that? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't even say uh, uh, anything here about Jesus rising from the dead. Now, some translations have verse 27. Mine does not have verse 27. Whoa, I got a knight. That's awesome. The helmet's pretty awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that it doesn't have verse 37. Why? Because it was added. And because verse 37, what it, what it says, it was added. It says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Now you say, well, what in the world? That verse is not in the, in the earlier translations, that verse is not there. It's not. And, and that's okay. What we realize is that the copyist or the editor added that in kind of in quotes, Hey, you know, if you believe, but we know that that's not in the earliest copies. And that's why we have such great, uh, copies of the text. Cause we can tell if somebody tried to change something from the original one, we always can find it. And, and that's why verse 37 in most Bibles is not present. Now, does verse 37 change anything? Doesn't change anything. Because no, everybody knows if you believe in your heart, right? You can. We we all know that. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, we all know that. That doesn't change. It'd be different if it said, well, if it was on the third Sunday of the fourth month, then you could. That would be a problem. But there's nothing that was added that would change anything that we know to be true on all our copies. So just know that. So when somebody says something to you, well, what about verse 37? That wasn't there. Why is that not there? So you don't have, no, we have, we have uh, document integrity because, because we have 2 million pages of all from uh, late first century all the way up to the third century uh, uh, pages. We have 2.3 million copies. We can tell when somebody may have uh, changed something or added something and and nothing is, has been changed or added that is of any significance because we know we identify it. There's this one, there's uh, the woman caught in adultery and the, uh, when they start talking about Mark 16, about the end of, uh, you know, snakes and vipers, we see when these were changed and, and those are the, the major ones that go, ah, well, these don't, they don't mean anything doctrinally, but it really helps us to know, wow, we really do have a, a copies of the New Testament that are really uh, accurate, which is pretty powerful. Verse 38, and he gave orders. So he sees water. He says, why shouldn't I be? He gave orders to stop the chariot. So that's what he does. Then both Philip and the eunuch, they went down into the water. People say sprinkled. No, they went down into the water. And what does he do? He baptized them. And then what do we see? When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. I don't know what that means, but the Spirit of the Lord took him away. Whether it was like blink of an eye, whether it was he moved him, he influenced him to go a different way. But all we know is the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Why? He had become a disciple of Jesus. Philip, however, appeared, appeared. It seems like this, wow, what is that? Knockout. That's pretty awesome, Daniel. Uh, it says, Philip, however, appeared at Aztos. Now, that that just, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. That seems like some kind of time travel or something like that. The spirit just, boom, whopped him out of there. I mean, so th this is crazy when you talk about the spirit of God and what it's doing. He just suddenly appeared. So when people start talking about how they, they got the powers of the Holy Spirit, I, I haven't seen anybody like uh, transverse the universe like that. It was a different time, and it was needed to establish what was going on. Very different. And that power of laying on by the apostles' hands, it died with the apostles. We don't have any more apostles. And it was given by the apostles. But boy, was it some pretty powerful stuff. And what did he do? He traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Wow, 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 people. <laughs> Acts chapter 8 is concluded. Wow. Hey, if you like what I'm doing, type in amen. If you like this, type in amen. In addition to that, hit the likes. Uh, if you're not following me, go ahead and follow me. Whoa, look at that ball. <laughs> That's awesome. Go ahead and follow me. 
If you're not following that way, anytime I uh, go live, you will be made aware. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, I put this on a YouTube page. If you want, uh, please go to the YouTube page. It's at Chipman. Oh, the lights. Come on, come on, come on. The roses. You guys are awesome. The uh, It's at Chip Mitchell 23. At You have to put the at sign before Chip Mitchell 23. And then on the YouTube page, and what I do is I upload this onto the YouTube page. That way you can always go back and reference, or if you couldn't watch all of it, you get to see the whole thing. Now it's raw. It's just me doing this and it's not fancy. Like all the uh, folks up there, it, it, you know, that, that do things on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> don't the other way. hot dogs, hot dogs and eggs. I've never seen that one. <laughs> the star. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Hey, you, you, you inspire me to get up and do this every morning at 7 a.m. It's a lot. Sometimes my voice gets a little hoarse. I gotta, I gotta be careful. Uh, uh, you got my corner <laughs> correct. Amen. But every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we work through a group, this whole group. We work through a, uh, a chapter in the Bible. Right now, we're working through the book of Acts. If you've missed this, I upload it to the YouTube page at Chip Mitchell. 23, please go there. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, follow? No, subscribe. And that way you'll you'll have that as well. Uh, <laughs> stop playing with it. Really? Hot dogs and eggs. <laughs> I've never thought about hot dogs and eggs. <laughs> but this is a great thing. Uh, do you mind? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Go ahead, Meg. Send, send me that. I'll send you her information and... Um, Absolutely. She's always willing to chat, talk. Um, thank you. Thank you, Potato. Thank you. Thank you for the encouragement. But this is what we do every morning. My, my goal is to be grounded in the word of God. And uh, and I like uh, working through from a teaching standpoint, not necessarily preaching. Preaching is great. We know that that's um, what God has called us to do as well, but also teaching. And it's And we have to be Students of the word where we get in-depth insight into the scriptures so that we can be grounded. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then what I do, so after I go through a chapter, if there's any questions on any of the subject matter we looked at, if I can answer them, I'll try. Um, yeah, I'm on at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I know people are coming from all over. It was a plate of breakfast. Come on, what's happening? Agape, great things. Always putting out great things on your page. So appreciate what you're doing. Great work here. Very positive. So appreciate what you're doing. Uh, Come on, Meg. I'm so encouraged. God, hey, you know what? God connects us all at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Agape. Appreciate what you do. You're doing a great work. Keep it going. Uh, We got to put out a message of God as positive as you can. Why does the gospel say it is adultery to marry a divorced woman? Yeah, wow. So, um, is it Diana? Um, one of the things that we read in the scriptures is marriage and divorce. Uh, marriage and divorce was one of the great debates in the first century. Because in the first century, one of the challenges that happened was men were saying, oh, the Bible says that you can only divorce your wife if she is unfaithful. And what they began to say, they, they gathered around them, these teachers, to say, if your wife burns your breakfast, She's unfaithful in fulfilling her duty. So you can go ahead and marry somebody else. You can divorce her. And um, Jesus, when he's questioned about this, this subject matter, he says God's intention was what? That they would be married forever. But he said, because of your hardening of your heart, Moses allowed you to have a certificate of divorce. But Moses said, well, you can only do that if your wife or your spouse is unfaithful, but it was so slanted towards men that men began to say, well, my wife was unfaithful. She burned my breakfast. So therefore I've divorced her. But notice what Jesus says in the context of it. He says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your life. And what is he getting at? Oh, thanks for the hat and mustache. He said, what is he getting at? He's saying, you've already committed. You've come up with this scheme, this plan that is wrong in your heart. And you were just, you had saw somebody else and you're looking for a reason to get out of this marriage. 
And so what Jesus is talking about there with adultery says, if you just divorce your, your spouse and, and your spouse has not been unfaithful, that unfaithful is pornea with regards to sexual intent, adultery. If you just leave them and then they go get married again, you're making them adulterous. In other words, God says, I still view you as married. And that, that's why he says that. And, and that has brought much debate in uh, the first century as well as in our century. Well, how do you handle marriage and divorce? And, and those are very challenging things to, to wrestle with. We, the Bible clearly says that Jesus says, unless there is unfaithfulness, that's, that's the reason for divorce. That's what he says. But then you've got to ask yourself the question then. So if someone is divorced and they didn't do it um, because someone was unfaithful, is that the unforgivable sin? Is Because say they went and got married and then all of a sudden they, they come upon a church and they say, hey, I want to be a Christian. And they do the story and they said, well, I got I divorced my wife. No, she wasn't adulterous. So I just divorced her because I didn't like her and I got remarried. So now what do you do? Well, you know, I, I think that you come as you are uh, in, in many ways. I, I, but those are some of the debates that go on. I think all of those situations are all, you got to take them to God. Uh, yeah, and so many people are committing adulteries, adulteries uh, with their new wife. It, it's just, it's a sad, it's a sad, sad scenario that we live in. Uh, and Jesus said it's because our hearts are even we know Jesus, why do why do we still sin? I smoked cigarettes, inventing pain pills for years. Well, in First John chapter one, it says, "If we claim that we do not have sin, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we claim to be a follower of Jesus, what does He say? We confess our sins, and He forgives us our sins, and we walk in the light and fellowship with one another." That. So he, he puts this idea, look, we strive for change, right? We, uh, now you give marriage, no, <laughs> you're awesome, Phil. Skip, you're awesome, dude. <laughs> um, so what are we seeing here? That there is a openness and confession. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. As if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So he's talking about this vulnerability and honesty about our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, but we walk in fellowship with one another. There, there's something about that. Um, very, very powerful. Skip, I flew to Draco yesterday. I was up there only for a couple hours. There was only three guys up there. Missed you, buddy. Uh, I gave him my three proposals and went to jail. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I too, I was married uh, many, many years ago, over 30 years ago. And my wife was unfaithful, and uh, we got a divorce, and now I'm married 27 years. Um, it's just, no matter where you shake it, uh, it it's painful. Um, it is really painful. Uh, divorce is, is, is really hard. And, uh, it gets very tricky on reconciliation, forgiveness, the wounds that are caused there. Um, it, it, it's, it's very challenging. And I think so much has to do with we watch movies and we think that's what marriage is all about. Um, you know, you watch, you know, these movies like Officer and a Gentleman and, you, you know, you see him sweeping her off her feet and he's got the uniform at the end of the movie. You watch that movie. That's a terrible story of love. I mean, so much to see. Uh, you know, but it is, it is hard. It is hard. I do recommend counseling. I, I do recommend finding professionals. Uh, one, if you're in a marriage situation that's very challenging, please, you know, get some help from a counselor. Not all counselors are the same. You may have to find one that you both feel comfortable with, but you need that third party to give you an outside perspective. In addition to that, um, you know, you may have gone through one and you need a, a, a personal counselor to just help you overcome what you want to. I, I had a counselor uh, through my divorce. I was diagnosed with uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, in light of what I went through and, you know, hey, it was very helpful. Um, I'll see you, see you later, Paul. Thanks so much for being with us. It was very helpful. Transformed my life. Gave me a healthy. Uh, yeah. 
You know, it's just what it is, man. This stuff is pain. Everyone needs counsel. <laughs> it helps so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you got to find the right one, right? Just because one wasn't good, you, you can always find another. But hey, guys, this is awesome. Got to get to work. Um, I'm so thankful for all of you. If you have not followed, please go ahead and follow. Uh, if you missed uh, this lesson, um, you you will be able to. Uh, yep, I wasn't. No, I was not a minister. I was not. No. Um, uh, if you uh, missed some of this, you can go to the YouTube page at Chip Mitchell 23. And that way, um, you know, you will uh, be able to catch up on. But hey, love you guys. This is awesome. I'm so encouraged. Go to my profile page, like there, like and follow. That'll help the algorithm. Really appreciate it. Meg, thanks for putting my name up there for the YouTube page. Uh, yes, it could have been us. God's grace. My bride. I will be married. Come on, man. 49 years. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yes, you have to put the at sign in the search bar uh, to get it. Um, I can't do the click on my profile page. It always goes to the motorcycle one. I can't change it. I don't know why that is, but who knows? But guys, it's been a great one. Let's close out with a prayer. And uh, Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow morning. We'll pray for my son and everyone that's evacuating down south. My son is down there doing some training. He's got to get out of there. So Father, you are awesome in every way. We do pray for everyone down there with the hurricane coming. Please protect them. Keep them safe. If we have family members like myself that are down there, Father, please protect them. Bring them home safely. God, you're amazing. Thank you for this forum. We have a great group of individuals. We're diving into the word. We're all learning together. We're gaining insights. Please continue to give us great wisdom and insight in your word. But allow us not just to learn it, but to be doers of your word. Help us to overcome the shortcomings in our life, the weaknesses that are there, the things that the demonic forces of evil are trying to impress upon us. Help us to thwart against them. God, you're amazing. We love you. We need you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the blessings, all the kind words. Super appreciate it. Lord willing, I'll see you all tomorrow morning at uh, 8 a.m. We're going to hit Saul, the conversion of Saul, Acts chapter 9. Wow. Oh, we hit 50,000. Come on. That's awesome, man. <laughs> All right, guys. Love you. So appreciate you. So appreciate what we're doing. Let's keep praying that God makes it clear what he wants us to do with this. Amen. Amen, guys. Love you.